A lot of people don't seem to know the difference between an evolutionary biologist and a marine biologist. Sure, there's an overlap, but you can't just exchange one for the other. As an evolutionary biologist, I've tried to explain the difference to my family for years. I can sort of understand how they can get it mixed up, but when you get to working out there in the real world, there really is no reason why an employer would confuse the two. The terms are not interchangeable. Therefore, I was skeptical when I was first asked to be involved with the Norwegian float project. The study was to be conducted entirely at sea within the help of both Icelandic and Norwegian government. The entire project was government sanctioned and everything was official and on the books. What wasn't talked about was what the project was actually about. For a time there was even a website, but the description was so generic that it was impossible to learn what was actually going on. Improving and understanding the life of a quickly changing ecosystem said an important man in a fancy suit through a YouTube link on the front page. I have a saying, when something is so generic that it can be applied to everything, it doesn't mean anything. Let's take a step back. I'm a biologist, evolutionary biologist specifically. I got everything up to my postdoc from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, Stockholm. I've been with a variety of colleagues from all over the world. I've published a paper with a fellow scientist on environmental impacts of electromagnetism in 2015, which I highly recommend reading. When I was asked to work for the Norwegian float back in 2017, I had just come back from a study in Iceland. I think this is what sparked their interest in my particular field of study, adaption in rapid temperature shifts. My specialty is working with fruit flies and stickleback fish. I had been working in the active volcanic areas of Iceland when our operation was suddenly defunded. To this day, I'm not sure why. I don't think it was a coincidence. This is when I was contacted by Norwegian Float Project, or NF for short. They asked me to be a part of a project located far out at sea, despite me being an evolutionary biologist. Again, not a marine biologist. It was weird, but I needed the work. Our entire Iceland project had been axed overnight, and I was just sitting at the hotel watching my bank account drain. I barely asked any questions. I just bought my sticklebacks and climbed aboard. Science ain't cheap. This is what I knew about NF at that point. The entire operation was set at the northern edge of the Norwegian Sea, just north of Iceland. No less than four science vessels were active on site, with daily check-ins from the Coast Guard. We were working in four teams, isolated from one another, only communicating through approved daily reports that went through what my boss called a funnel. It was a fancy way of saying all communication between teams was monitored, rewritten, and double-checked. Our vessel, the Heyerdahl, could hold a crew of about 12 people with plenty of space to run samples. On my first day out there, I still had no idea what was going on. My colleagues, four Norwegian men and an Icelandic woman, tried to fill me in. It is hard for a landlubber, like me, to be out in the middle of the Norwegian sea like this. The waves can reach so high that you swear you are going to capsize. Nothing feels solid and it can take days before you reach the point where you feel the waves in your mind before you feel them in your legs. It dips into freezing temperatures at night and the power necessary to keep climate control running is ridiculous. I can't imagine someone willingly staying out there for a prolonged period and yet I signed up for four weeks. That was what was stated in my initial contract. We were assigned to work in pairs. I worked with the Icelandic woman Selma. She was an actual marine biologist and just as surprised to see me there as I was. She had little to no idea what was going on either. We had our first mission briefing 36 hours after first stepping foot on the Heyerdahl. We were sitting in this small cafeteria sized room. Everything there is metal and if the ship rocks too much it all starts screeching. A man I'd never seen before had set up a projector and our crew sat down to listen. Everyone was wearing thick jackets, caps and gloves but most of us were still shuddering. The man with the projector wasn't. Do you know the term island biome was the first thing he asked us. Most of us nodded. An island biome is the term for an ecologic system that has been largely separated from other systems for a long period of time. Kinda like the Galapagos Islands, Darwin's Finches. We found an island biome and we need to study it. We need experts from a wide range of areas so I imagine things will be a bit confusing as we start. Don't be afraid to air your concerns, but please be aware that we are just as confused as you are. 
He fired up the projector. The image made it clear. They found something over 13,000 feet into the sea. A few weeks earlier, there had been a tectonic shift. The NF project had been a standby government task force between the Norwegian and the Icelandic government for years, just in case they needed to put together a team at short notice. They had been expecting something like this to happen eventually. Shortly after the shift, they noticed areas of the ocean being discolored, black, through satellite imagery, looking for new land masses. Shortly afterwards, they found an isolated pocket far beneath the ocean surface. This pocket of the ocean, at about 14,000 feet, had been isolated for millions of years. Now it was released into the ocean. An isolated island biome is suddenly introduced to the Norwegian Sea. The reason for the ocean to turn black in the area was nothing short of microbes. Imagine the number of microbes necessary to color the ocean for several square miles. We were shown a series of images, thick slabs of goo almost like oil slapping against the hull of the Heyerdahl. The man with the projector told us we would be allowed to study this in person and that samples were already being provided. Further samples would be gathered at the request of the team. The implications of this were unfathomable. What kind of life forms have evolved to survive all those crushing deaths? I'm not gonna lie, I was excited to get started. So were my colleagues. We were issued some standard safety equipment and briefed on basic protocols. The project was fairly secret as to avoid potentially damaging traffic. We had to surrender our personal cell phones to two men armed with pistols. That first night, we were given some initial samples. My colleagues were ecstatic and most of the night we were up throwing around names for new species. At least 13 unknown kinds were identified just that first night. We were surprised to see that most of the microbes were fungi and opposed to the expected algae, mushrooms at the bottom of the sea. Who would have known? The first few days was amazing. Our reports were smoothly rolling between our four teams and we identified at least 37 different types of fungi in the waters. By this time, we were getting ready to send down deep sea cameras and diving teams. We were still pretty excited about the entire event and even the armed guards didn't seem so frightening to us. They were good guys just trying to do their job after all. They had no reason to be unpleasant. We all ate together in the cafeteria every day. Lots of salted fish and crisp bread as per Scandinavian tradition. My favorite guard, Hellman, made amazing mayonnaise and tuna sandwiches for us. At the end of the first week, we were getting some strange reports. Most of the fungus we'd been testing had a mineral in common that we were unable to identify. We tried to extract it, and in a few days we had three grams of a completely unknown metal sitting in our lab. Our boss was beyond excited. The third team had a geologist who was unable to even take a guess at what kind of metal we were looking at. It was almost like a crystalline structure, but more similar to lead. We were promised an expert would look into it in a couple of days. We still had our heads spinning with daily discoveries. We even discovered larger life forms like fish. Still, they were smaller than the nail on your pinky finger, but they were actual complex life forms, completely black, pellet-shaped and eyeless. These fish, just as the fungus, had large traces of the unknown metal embedded in their scales. Our superiors gave it the name of Blameless Metal, fell free in Norwegian, claiming with a shrug that it was as good as a name as any. After all, it wasn't the metal's fault it had been surfaced. It was blameless, see? We found it kind of funny. You have to remember, we thought we were standing at the edge of the discovery of a century. We had a pretty bright headspace at the time. After two weeks, we were all pretty used to working on the Heyerdahl. We all knew each other by name, and we had strict routines that we followed. The expert had arrived and was working with Team 2, but initial tests were inconclusive. The only thing we knew for sure was the blameless was a previously undiscovered kind of metal that most of the life forms had evolved to gain nourishment from. Selma and I were working on testing the effects of the fungus environment on my spickleback fish. The other teams were using divers to gain less pressure damage samples. There was also a deep sea camera being set up, but we were having trouble finding relevant data. Every day the microbes were diluted and the massive amounts of moving water would start to drift us further and further away from the point of origin. Soon, we were split up into two teams with two vessels each, those following microbe migration down the current and those of us who stayed at the origin site. Selma theorized that a particular set of fungus was formed by how deep the isolation biome stretched, as the fungus closer to the ceiling of the bubble was smaller than the larger fungus that lived deeper down. Essentially, 
It allowed us to gain a sense of how large the pocket really was. Some would ballpark that it was about 2,000 to 2,500 meters in depth, depending on size variation. Still, the crown of our discovery was by far the unidentified metal. At the start of my fourth week, I started to see a troubling change in my spicklebacks. I noticed there were fewer of them, and the water was growing darker despite having a functioning filter. Their behavior changed. They would start swimming in circular patterns around one of the larger females who would eat them alive. She grew to be more than three times the size of the other spicklebacks, and in two days was the only living fish left in the tank. The dark color of the aquarium came from rapidly multiplying fungus. A lack of pressure didn't seem to be an issue. I reported this to our supervisors and asked them to do further testing on how fast this fungus could spread and whether it was a vast difference when treated with fresh, salt, or brackish water. Selma agreed that it was important and she was starting to grow worried. However, it was made clear that our main focus should be the metal. Apparently, Team 2 had found that it was extremely reflective. They had managed to gather enough to make a small cube of it and the thing reflected so much light it could damage your eyes during prolonged contact. It could also gain enough heat to start a small fire. It was extremely conductive, far surpassing gold and copper. With this potential game changer at hand, my spicklebacks weren't the focus of the Norwegian government anymore. Selma, on the other hand, was anxious. She took on the responsibility of doing whatever test management asked us to. I was free to keep experimenting on the spicklebacks and their reaction to the fungus. One morning when I got to the lab, week 5, the big spickleback female, dubbed Kroger by my team, was nowhere to be seen. The lid of the small aquarium had been pushed aside and a black slime trill had been left on the floor. I found Kroger wiggling halfway across the room, straight towards my other spicklebacks in the control tank. We decided enough was enough and killed it. That's when we discovered a few troubling features during the autopsy. Kroger had lost both her eyes and the bones had deteriorated to a sort of black mush. The entire physiology of the fish was getting replaced by something jelly-like. The concentration of the metal was higher, especially in the brain. Selma flagged in her report that we needed to take increased security measures and that the fungus could be dangerous when inhaled. Management didn't listen, but we started wearing gas masks from that point on. Many of my colleagues followed suit voluntarily. This was only the start of our troubles. The diving teams reporting getting burns as if stung by jellyfish straight through their diving suits. We were told about long lightning-like burns on their torsos, arms, and thighs. One of them had apparently been so harshly burned that they had gone into analytic shock. They were to be immediately returned to the surface, risking decompression sickness. We were not told about this in any of the reports, but by the guards who we'd gotten to know by now. Hellman was just as worried as we were. But everything went to shit when by week six, it started raining. It was a cold morning in early April when the rains came, and it was immediately obvious that something wasn't right. The water drops were thick and almost the size of golf balls. Some of them fell so hard and fast that there were cracks in the glass of the main bridge. We were ordered inside, but Selma managed to get a few samples. The management was duct taping towels to the glass, trying to cover it up. It was the same fungus that we studied, but slightly refined. The fungus had tagged along the evaporating ocean water and become a part of the rain formation cycle. This happens to some degree in nature all the time, but I'd never seen anything like it. It was far too aggressive. The clouds were solid black. Drops weren't just falling, they were dripping, forming a pore-like texture on the black clouds. The sky looked like a big hairy creature with drops falling from hair-like tendrils. For a moment, it felt like the end of the world. Nothing has ever made me felt so small, so insignificant. The guards were having trouble getting their uniforms off. The droplets were so thick and quickly hardened, turning into a slime-like substance. Niels, one of my colleagues, was starting to complain about a stinging, salt-like sensation in his eyes. Thinking back on what happened to Kroger, I was getting a bad feeling. It all went to hell quickly. Niels locked himself in the bathroom, vomiting. One of the guards, Hellman, stripped naked and started scratching his skin with an army knife. Selma and I tried to get our safety equipment, but there was no time. Three of our colleagues got there first, and one of the guards started waving his pistol around. Things were about to go bad, so we just stepped out. We wrapped ourselves in ponchos and hurried up on deck. The drops were so big that I was struck to the ground. Selma helped me up, 
Smith stepped away as she saw my hands covered in black. Trying to walk on the upper decks was like sliding back and forth in wet mud. We also noticed the boat wasn't rocking as much as usual. The ocean surface had turned a bit more... solid. We got to the main bridge, but were locked out. They refused to let us in, and when we were being insistent, they started threatening us. They assured us they would use force to keep us out if necessary. We abandoned the idea and ran to the rescue boats, pulled the plastic tarp over us, and tried to wait it all out. After a few hours, the clouds covered the sky. It was barely 11 a.m., and it was completely black outside. Selma and I stayed quiet, hearing the thick smatter of droplets on the plastic tarp. We could hear screams coming from the main deck. Selma peeked out at one point, but quickly looked away. There's something in the water, she whispered. I peeked out but could only catch a glimpse before Selma pulled me away. There were thousands of them, endless fairy lights just beneath the mucous surface of the ocean. I'm sure it was the reflective metal reacting to our warning lights, bouncing off of thousands of life forms. By 1 p.m., we heard gunshots. We hid under the tarp, but we could hear the scene playing out. Someone was running out on the main deck, followed by at least six other people. While someone was looking away, I peeked out. I could see Hellman standing at the front of the main deck. He was naked and bleeding, holding a gun out towards five of our colleagues. In the front was Nils. His face turned completely black. I could see his eyes. Stay back, Hellman screamed. Get back inside. They didn't stay back. Instead, they reached for him groaning. Kill me, they begged. Eat me. As they grabbed Hellman, he started firing blindly. I covered my head and ears just waiting for it all to be over. For at least half an hour, there were guttural screams. People begging, pleading, screaming for Hellman to kill them. Kill them and eat them people crying, screaming, trying to force themselves into his mouth. What worries me is what I heard at the end before things went quiet. They were no longer begging and crying. They were thanking him. Then nothing. A few hours passed. We could hear helicopters and the drops stopped falling on our tarp. You have no idea how loud a helicopter really is until you're standing right below one. They're deafening. Selma and I were given blindfolds and carried out to the nearby Coast Guard boat. People were screaming in Icelandic, but I could barely hear it over the helicopters. As we were getting further and further away from the site, I slowly realized that Selma and I had been separated. I had my blindfold on for close to eight hours when I was pushed into a decontamination room. My clothes were cut off with scissors, and I was sprayed with freezing water and antiseptics. I could have sworn it was pure chlorine. They shaved my head. They took blood tests and I was forced to blow through some kind of tube like a sobriety test. They also tapped my teeth with some sort of tiny hammer. I was in quarantine for a week. It wasn't bad, just a small room and no human contact. No internet, but pretty much anything I could ask for otherwise. I spent that week reading and writing down my thoughts. Pretty much everything I wrote down was confiscated by the end of the week and I was forced to sign an agreement not to talk about it. I'm thinking, you know, to hell with it. What the hell is Iceland going to do about it? I've been completely disconnected from the Norwegian float project since, but it's still up and running. I've read reports about black spots appearing along the ocean current, as I suspect the fungus is migrating. The northern coast of Iceland was briefly evacuated following the resurgence of one of those black spots, but they claimed it was for seismologic reasons. Bullshit. Didn't see any papers mentioning the apparent mass suicides. That's why I'm on Reddit. This is where I get the real info. I've seen videos of people freaking out the same way the crew of the Heyerdahl did, begging to be killed and eaten. It seems to be a recurring pattern, and I've seen it triggered in all manner of strange ways. The weirdest thing I've seen was some sort of video game triggering the same effect in people. Also, one of my old colleagues seems to have worked on something that seems eerily familiar to the blameless metal we found. Small world, isn't it? It's the same person I worked on my article about the electromagnetism back in 2015. I think the NF project has tried to contain this thing. There was a period when there were barely any black spots at all during most of 2018 and 2019, but all of a sudden they just started popping up out of nowhere. They're still out there. You can find them on Google Maps even. See for yourself. The biggest I've seen is at 
negative 22.27249413331312. It wasn't just Brexit that screwed with commercial fishing in the UK. Let's leave it at that. It started off the coast of Norway and Iceland, but there are black spots appearing as far as Ireland and the UK. By my predictions and following the migration patterns, the next few spots will start to appear outside the coast of Newfoundland and the Gulf of St. Lawrence in late 2021. Just as an example, I'll show you a satellite image I found from last September. Please keep in mind that this was just south of the coast of Greenland. It's not far away from the US mainland by now. I don't even want to think about what the Kroger human would look like, but from my calculations, it could be a monstrosity as tall as 20 feet. That's just a rough estimate based on the little time I had to study these things. Look for the black spots. Look for the symptoms. They make you beg and squirm. They make you want to be eaten. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed tonight's story. And if you did, please leave a like, comment, and share it with your friends. And if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. And as always, I'll be seeing you.